Dearly Father, we thank you so much for revealing yourself to us, for sharing about who you are and sending your son to save us from our sins. Yet there are many things that we don't understand about you, Lord, that are mysteries to us. We thank you for the gracious gift of faith in you that you have given us by the Holy Spirit, who we are studying today in the third article of the Creed. Bless our conversation that it may build us up in knowledge and in truth and edify you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Ooh. It works a lot better without the mask, apparently. Okay. All right. So the third article, the Apostles' Creed, I put that on the outline. Let's read that together, the part in bold there. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. So that is what our, our focus of our study is going to be today, is the third article of the Creed. Who is the main actor here? The Holy Spirit. Very good. And what is what we say is the Holy Spirit doing? Gives us the Jesus stuff. Ah, hey, somebody was listening to the sermon last week. Gives us the Jesus stuff, right? <laughs> what happens to a what happens to a human person when they're given the Jesus stuff? Creates faith. Creates faith, right? So we would say that they're justified by that faith in Jesus, and they now begin to live what? A sanctified life. Very good. Right? And so what the Holy Spirit does is creates faith and then assists us in living the sanctified life. Right? And so that's what we're talking about here. Right? That's the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and then the resurrection of body and life everlasting. Right? Okay. So let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 16. We're going to answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? This may sound familiar to you. It was our, uh, one of our readings last week. Anytime you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're usually in John quite a bit. John chapter 16, we're going to start at verse 8. And I'll read it so that we can uh, hear it online here. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So who's the Holy Spirit? The declarer of Jesus to us. Yeah, the declarer of Jesus to us. Or in the, in, in the spirit of today, he's one of the persons of the Trinity. And that's an important reminder because, myself included, I think we often think of this, the Holy Spirit as like a force rather than a person emanating from the, the Father and the Son, which is not the way the Scripture is presented, right? That he's a, a, fully, he's a fully representative person of the Trinity, right? Uh, and this is expressed when Jesus says that he's going to send, he doesn't say, you're to, like he mentions power on high, but then he gives that power on high name. He says, I'm going to send a what to you? Helper. Paraclete. Paraclete, right? That's the Greek word there. Helper, right? Which means that it's a person, right? A being that's being sent, not just a force from God the Father and God the Son. All right. So I mentioned this in my sermon today, uh, but when we do a, when we say the creed, Right? Notice here what we said. We didn't say, I believe the Holy Spirit, as if he's someone just telling us something. But we're saying that we believe in. Right? And that word in is significant. Right? Um, so if I say, I believe Russ, 
what sort of situation would I use that sort of sentence? I believe him. He's trustworthy. So if you're so if you're saying that, you're usually referring to something he said, right? But somebody Russ says something, and somebody says, "Oh, I believe him. I believe Russ because he's not a liar, right?" What's the difference between that and saying, I believe in Russ? I believe in his mission and in his vision and in his outlook and in his plans. Right. It's a much more encompassing way of saying it, right? Because then when Russ comes to me with something that I don't understand, I'm okay because I believe in Russ, right? So like with his kids, for example, if he's got to make a difficult decision and they're in a, a dangerous situation, you know, they believe in him to take care of them. So even if they don't know what's going to happen, they're going to be looking to him, right? So it's the same with our faith in God, except magnified to an unspeakable degree, right? That we're not just believing the stuff he tells us about himself, but we're believing in him, right? Um, that really is the gospel, right? The gospel isn't what Jesus tells us about, but it is Jesus, right? So it isn't just faith in what Jesus says, but faith in him that saves us. So I wanted to point that out because Luther had a little excursus on that um, that was pretty, I thought, pretty well written, of course. And uh, he, he mentioned that, the importance of that word in. Right? And I thought that was worth pointing out. All right, now flip to John chapter 14. <laughs> Somebody want to read verses 25 through 27. Okay. And the question we're pondering while Bob reads this for us is, what does the Holy Spirit talk about? All this I have spoken while I'm still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. All right. What translation are you reading from there? Oh, NIV. NIV. Okay. No, that's fine. I, there's this one particular phrase that I really like the way they phrase it in the SV. Uh, in verse 26, it says, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. All right. And so, like, that, that sentence there is, in a, is part of our faith in the scriptures as being the word of God. Right. Well, like sometimes the objection is, well, it's written by so many different people. How can it be God's inerrant word? Because of the Holy Spirit, right? He's going to bring to your remembrance. I like that phrase. Bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So perfect recall as God intends it to be in that sense. Right? Um, so what does the Holy Spirit talk about? Very good. Jesus, right? So uh, that highlights right there the very first thing in 25. These things I have spoken to you, right? All the things that Jesus has taught his disciples while I am still with you, but I'm not going to be with you soon. So I'm going to send somebody, the Holy Spirit, the helper, with whom the Father will send in my name, and he will teach you all things and bring your bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Yeah. This is good time for the question. Sure. Okay. It's always a good time for a digression. So these verses seem to, to make the Holy Spirit out to, to have, while eternal, like a, a temporal engagement with humanity that begins when Jesus ascends to the Father, essentially. That, that he lives forever, but we experience him here. Like Jesus says, I'll go and I'll, but I'll the God, the Father will send him. So essentially, they'll, they'll be replaced. Like we're not both here at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that's one of the very interesting phrases here in John, because I think it's in 16, a little bit before we read before. Um, let's see. But that's how we experience Jesus, too. Right, right. so it's, here in verse 7, it says, but if I if I don't go, or if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Right. Yeah. Um, and the way that we typically understand that, here, I'll read the note in my study Bible here. Wait, let me finish my Okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, and, and that's similar to how, I mean, Jesus, his, while eternal, he interacts with human history, at least as a bodily presence, for that 36-year period. Correct. So, but 
um, one of my favorite, I mean, we sing it, the Psalm 51 verse where, where David says, take not your spirit from me. And the DSV actually says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. So if David right. had this concept of the Holy Spirit, which I, when you read Psalm 51 as, or when you read the Holy Spirit as being essentially that who reminds us of, what God has forgiven us, you know, reminding us essentially our conscience, those kinds of things. Sure. David is saying, please don't take your conscience from me. Don't, right. don't make me a person that has, it doesn't have your law written on my heart. Well, think about the definition I gave you, right? The Holy Spirit gives you the Jesus stuff. What was the Jesus stuff during Abraham's life? Looking the, promise. Promise. the promise, right? The promise of the Messiah. So really, it's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't interacting with us before but now something new has occurred and the relationship between the holy spirit and us is different right and it and seemed so, much more selective before like you know there was you know the spirit resting on uh king saul for that little bit and there right. you know it, it was very selective where now it seems like it's more you know since the day of pentecost it was more general it's shared with jesus's church Right. In a very general way, where I don't know that that spirit was shared with all of Israel in such a, a general way. It, it seemed very person selective. There, kind of. there are like the person selective instances, like Saul, as you mentioned. But we would, I think, we would say that <laughs> it follows the pattern of the expansion of the people of God, right? So in the Old Testament, you'd say that the, the spirit of God would be resting on David and, and God's people through their worship of God and the temple and their sacrifices and all those things. Now, there are, are very specific instances where the Holy Spirit is on somebody in a particular way, like um, when, uh, like, you know your name? Mary's sister. No, 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 uh, Mary's mother of God, or her cousin. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, where when Elizabeth, praises mary and then it says in multiple times there that the holy spirit came upon them and then they they proclaimed right both her and mary and that's where we got the magnificat right so there are are particular instances there but we would say i would agree with you that it is more generally applied after jesus because the promise given for god's people and even the term god's people is now more generally applied to the church not just the people of historic israel anymore um and the reason that the Holy Spirit couldn't come in this capacity until Christ ascended, is that until his ascension, his work of redemption that the Holy Spirit was going to bear witness to was not yet done. Right? And so his ascension completes that, and then the Holy Spirit is sent to bear witness about those things. Right? So think about like Peter's sermon that we just read in, in Acts chapter 2. Right? And that was when the Holy Spirit came upon him, that's what he uttered. And it was all about the works of what Jesus had fully accomplished about. Right? Yeah, right. It was prior to Pentecost, you know, it's all through the Old Testament. The Spirit would come and go, whereas now the Spirit's always here, just that we don't always listen. Right, yeah, and that's an important thing, too, because um, one of the things, especially, and this, this is where I highly recommend Grace Upon Grace um, by John Kleinig, if you've never read it. Um, he's an Australian Lutheran pastor, very solid theologian. He's written a couple of our commentaries, but the, one of the points that he makes about that, which is a blessed reality for us, because Lutherans, I think, typically have a hard time with the Holy Spirit, right? Precisely because he's going to do what he wants, right? But now in Jesus, we have some specific promises where the Holy Spirit is not only guaranteed to be present, but to function in a particular way. And that's for our benefit, right? The word, baptism, communion. So if you're ever wondering, oh my gosh, I don't know if the Holy Spirit is with me, even though we know, you know, in this context he is, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that, open your Bible and he's there. Right. Um, and so that's where one of my phrases I think I've said here before is don't put God in a box, but if he puts himself in a box, you should open the box. Right. And so in Jesus, God, for our benefit, according to his love and mercy, is putting himself in, in boxes for us in ways that we can interact with them and see and touch and smell right and he's attached the work of the holy spirit to that stuff so which is why uh like maybe today in worship this the style of worship today is not your thing and you weren't really feeling it right 
which is fine. But don't let that make you think then that the spirit is not present, that God is not present, because it's not a tie. His presence and his promises are not tied to our subjective feeling of his presence, but the promise of where he will be. Right. So even if you're having a rough week and worship isn't, isn't just doing the normal thing for you, the promise of forgiveness is still yours. The gifts of Christ are still yours. Spirit is still present, right? Uh, and that is something of, of extreme comfort to us, right? And brought to us in ways that we can recognize, right? Precisely because it would be very difficult if the Holy Spirit is just going where he wants to go because we have no way of knowing and grasping that. And part of that is his nature. Good digression. All right. So who does the Holy Spirit talk about? He talks about Jesus. Now, what does the Holy Spirit talk about? So we'll jump back to John 15, look at verse 26. I know that one. Go ahead, Cheryl, read your voice. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about him. All right, so what does the Holy Spirit talk about? Truth. The Spirit of truth. Truth. And what is truth? I'll punch this final question for you. No biggie. What is truth? It's an easy one, right? Right. Jesus is the truth, right? Um, so the answer to who and what is actually the same. Who's the Holy Spirit talking about? Jesus. What's the Holy Spirit talking about? Jesus. And of course, Jesus is the truth. And that's a significant connection. Because I'm going to throw out a fun, like, theologian word for you. So this, this language has a, pop, a very big impact on what your hermeneutical lens is. Okay? And what that means is that's fancy. It, well, actually, you can use your, your glasses as an example. Right? What do your glass lenses do? They clear things up, right? What, do they just, just some things? No, like everything. everything, right? So a hermeneutical lens is like your lens for reading the Bible or your lens for understanding what is good and true, okay? So depending on what that is, it's not just affecting the way you think about one thing in particular, but the way you see everything, okay? So if our hermeneutical lens is that Jesus is the truth, what does that then mean about all those other little things out there? By what are we interpreting it? Through the lens of Jesus. Through the lens of Jesus. Right? So, for example, when we read the prophecies in Isaiah, and they're talking about the suffering servant who is, is pierced for our transgressions, and by his wounds we are healed. Who's that about? Jesus, right? Our lens of Christ. Right? Now, this has all, also all kinds of practical applications, too, because what does our world say that love is? A feeling. A feeling. What else? It's, a, it's just a feeling, an emotion. It's like not objecting to anything about the person, right? Uh, you're just beautiful the way you are, or you're, you're loved as you are. And if we're if our hermeneutical lens is Jesus, what's our response to those kinds of things? That is the way it is. That's not true. That's not the truth, right? Because our truth is Jesus. And what does Jesus say love is? Love is patient. Love is kind. Right? You got 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah. Right? And so, like, I think when I preached on this, maybe I don't even know how many weeks ago now. It's all running together in my head. Um, but agape. Right? The special kind of love that only comes from God. And we experience that through Jesus. And we are, in fact, incapable of loving in that manner without Jesus. Right? And so what this means when we're linking Jesus to the truth, that means that he's our lens for looking at all of life. Right? And that, I think, is very helpful in clarifying the way that we approach certain practical situations in our world, because what you're essentially doing is imagine that you're walking around with a Jesus-shaped lens on your face, and everybody else is walking around with their own lens. Maybe their lens is a football, or maybe their lens is 
uh, you know, Joe Biden or the government, or maybe their lens is sport, of sport of any kind, or their family, or whatever it is, right? And whatever your lens is, that's the way you're evaluating all the information you see, is through that lens. And our goal as Christians is to try and keep that lens as Jesus. Right? And who helps us do that? The Holy Spirit. Right? So, because our natural inclination is to always be like, well, but I want to make this my lens. And the Holy Spirit's like, well, 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 let's come back over here. Right? Um, and otherwise, we would be, our sanctified life would be a hot mess. All right. Any questions about that? All right, so now let's get into what the Holy Spirit does for me. So open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. All right, Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verse 22 verses. And for the sake of our friends online here, I'll, I will read them for us. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, and the way was the early term for the Christian faith, the followers of Christ, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now notice there, right, what does he already call the voice? Lord, Lord. Lord. Right, even before he knows who he is. So this, this always sort of reminded me that, like, um, when you're in the presence of God, you know it. He doesn't have to explain who he is. Uh, and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Right? So, was Paul given a choice in what happened to him here? No. no. What happened? God just said, you know what? I got plans for you. And go in the city and wait, and I'll tell you what you're going to do next. Well, that's a pretty sobering reminder who's in charge. It doesn't seem like he accepted Jesus into his heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah roughly in the point. It doesn't seem like he accepted Jesus into his heart. Um, yeah, right? So that uh, we don't like decision theology language for that reason, because it's sort of like a, a, imagine a scenario and that we're, we're witnessing here with Paul. And like you're trying to tell that person that Jesus you know what, I kind of like what you say, Jesus. You can come on in. It's not the way it works. He just comes in. Yeah, in uh, today's reading, uh, you know, in Acts, kept saying, this Jesus, this Jesus. You know, that really drives it in. Yeah, right, right. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So he led them by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is cho a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the church and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I like that interaction there with Ananias. Because, you know, imagine like... You know, you know of somebody who is in the surrounding countryside who's burning down churches and rounding up fellow believers and, and throwing them in jail or presiding over their stoning to death. And then God comes to you and says, I need you to go to that guy and 
heal his lack of sight and tell him what I want you to tell him about being a believer. Ananias has such a human response here. He's like, um, are you sure? <laughs> you sure you got the right guy? I've heard about this guy. I don't know if you, I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. It's a very Peter mode where Peter's like, well, listen here. <laughs> listen here, Jesus. That's not the plan, right? Uh, and, and here Ananias is doing the same thing, which of course we do all the time, right? We think we know better. And so we're like, this can't be the plan. Here's the plan. And um, and but and it says, but the Lord said to him, go. Right? That's an imperative. That's a command. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. Right? You have some wrong. Yeah, hey, your commentary is all saying that it's different Ananias than Ananias and Sapphira. But is there any chance it is the same one? It's only a couple of years apart. Um. If the commentaries pretty much unanimously agree that it's not, that's probably the case. I haven't studied that specifically, so I don't know for sure. Let me see if it says something in here. It doesn't mention it in, in the notes here either. All right, verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. All right. So what does the Holy Spirit do for me? So if you're thinking of the story of Paul's conversion, what does the Holy Spirit do for me, for you? That 180 degree turn. Yeah. Right. He becomes a follower of Jesus. Yeah. He becomes a follower of Jesus. That's how you became a follower of Jesus. No, I mean, it doesn't mean that you were walking along the road and got blinded and God spoke to you, right? But the Holy Spirit came to you as well. And I, I don't think it's an accident here with the vision and the sight stuff that's going on. Right? That's very intentionally been added. As part of that dynamic of the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. One of the things that we would say is usually attributed to the Holy Spirit is vision. We now see things as they really are, right? And so here are these verses right next to each other. Brother Saul, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, and immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. I have a, I have a question. About yeah. Could Paul have made a sinful decision to not be the Lord's instrument? And the reason why I'm asking is that there is a sentence in the King James and the New King James Version that all the other Bibles seem to eliminate in verse 5. About, you know, it's far too big against the goats, which is a yeah. So Paul, I feel like I could sinfully, but I could sinfully turn my back on my faith and walk away. It's why I'm not a Calvinist, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but it doesn't sound like Paul could walk away from this. It doesn't sound like he had free will here. Sure. Yeah. So and, and we would say that that would be correct. So uh, if the work of conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit, then it's going to happen when the Holy Spirit wants it to, right? Now that what where we really differ from the Calvinists isn't necessarily the acceptance or the rejection at the outset, but like, could you turn away later? Could Paul have turned away later? I suppose it's a possibility, but like, there's also some unique aspects to Paul because he's being called specifically as an apostle. 
Right. Um, and so like here, when when Ananias sort of pushes back against God's plan here, he says, he doesn't just say, I'm like calling him to be my own. He says, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. The children's children. Yeah, exactly. Which so is an interesting. Which is an interesting. So he didn't moment. really have a choice in this moment. This was this was his everything right now. Correct. Right. He had no choice, right? So free will is an interesting thing because we don't have it, right? Um, and we like to think we do, right? So, um, and this could be a whole Bible study series we could do bondage of the will at some point if people want to. Which is Luther's big writing on that, because there was a big argument between him and Erasmus on this issue of three will. It's an argument that still goes on. Uh, that's all the decision theology stuff, right? Um, but I had a clear Lutheran pastor explain to me one that we don't have free will on the positive side of things because there's nothing good in us. We actually have free will on the negative side of things, on the sinful side of things. Yes. So. So this is another one of those. It was that question I was asking about with Paul. Could he have sinfully said no to this invitation, or is you can't kick against the goads? Meaning you're just stuck with me right now because I've chosen you, and you got to do this job. Yeah. So I think for Paul, it's probably more of the latter. Okay. Right. That because he's not he's not your run of the mill person who's going to follow Jesus. He's someone that Jesus has set apart. Just the same with the disciples, right? Um, that. And the same with Judas, right? Judas was sort of preordained to have the function that he did, uh, which is that when we get into that stuff, it's very difficult for us to to, to grasp that. Andrew Lloyd Webber makes that very clear. <laughs> <laughs> but the the uh, the point about if if I am a believer, it's all on God, and if I'm an unbeliever, it's on me. That's another one of those mysteries of of Scripture that. Like it would stand to reason, according to our human reason, that if I can reject something, then I must also accept it. But the Bible doesn't talk about it that way. And so we're careful not to, not because we don't want to, we intentionally don't want to make sense, but it actually robs us of the promise of the gospel. Why did those, right. all those other translations omit this sentence? I'm not sure. It could be. So typically when something like that happens, it's a uh, manuscript thing. Okay. So in a lot of, in a lot of the, um, I don't, I don't have my Greek New Testament on me, but I could bring it and show you. At the bottom of the Greek New Testament, there is a whole um, list of all of the different uh, papyrus pieces and, and manuscripts that we've un recovered and uncovered over time. And there are some that are viewed as more reliable. So sometimes they will choose that based on those. But, uh, the, big, the reason that those sea scrolls were such a big deal is they were some of the oldest and most complete manuscripts of the scriptures that we had found at that point. Um, so that those kind of discoveries may change small amount, like small wording choices and things like that. So it could be that from one edition to the next, the scholars shifted their thoughts on whether or not certain words were included or not. Now, uh, this sort of, uh, well, I will offer this digression because I think bringing that up can cause some confusion without some explanation. Um, if there are slight variability in the possible wording of passages is that a, is that problematic for our faith i don't think so <laughs> why not well because it's redemptive history from beginning to end and the message doesn't change right i actually think this was helpful in me thinking that paul doesn't have a choice here and I think it, I think it was a useful sentence because I didn't know what it meant, and I had to look it up. Sure. Um, but so the the point I'm making though is like, is your faith in the Bible, or is it in what the Bible, who the Bible is about? It's in the Bible. So you you believe in this book, or do you believe in Jesus? Jesus, but we believe that the Holy Spirit right. wrote this book. Right. Sure. So, so you believe that this, we believe that this is a spirit-inspired, faithful witness to Jesus. Yes. Right. So what about the little words here and there that it shifted around and changed them from time to time? I like the same, same English version, which is another um, 
Sure, sure. So we, we in, in our tradition, and I think we're one of the last remaining denominations that actually require, if you're going to be a pastor in our church, you have to pass proficiency in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, you have to pass proficiency in, in biblical Greek and biblical Hebrew. Um, and they, you don't even get credit for them at the seminary. They're pre-required courses. So um, we do take a lot of effort to figure out what exactly God's word says. Are we, is this really the last uh, denomination that looks at it that way? I think so. I mean, when I was in St. Louis, the, uh, the our, our Greek professor was the teacher at the Catholic school. And it wasn't a required course for them. It was a recommended course. Um, and they would have been probably one of the only other remaining ones that would do that. So there may be some really particular Orthodox groups that might still. Well, but as far as I know. Well, maybe Wisconsin Senate does too. Yeah. I, I meant more like, I guess I should specify more like conservative biblical Lutheran okay. approach. Um, but uh the point I'm making is like if if uh you know let's say like there's 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 some contestation about the end of Mark, right? That there's a bunch of verses added to the end of Mark that aren't in some of the really early manuscripts, right? So is it a huge deal whether or not those are included? And one of those verses is that uh, the like the one of the baptism verses, right? Believe those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. <laughs> It's a word of truth, but it's also spoken elsewhere in the Gospels. Right, right. So one, it's not a huge deal to us because we believe that the scriptures are all run through the lens of Jesus, right? So if one thing drops away, it's not going to get rid of the whole teaching of it. But two is like our faith is in the word made flesh, Jesus, right? So if the, the man-made translations of, of the text vary bit to bit, it really doesn't bother us that much because the book of the Bible, this Lutheran study ESV, doesn't save you. Jesus does, right? Uh, and that's a key. Uh, the reason I pointed that out is if you're like a really hardcore Christian fundamentalist on the evangelical side of things, these things are a massive deal because they typically put their faith in the Bible below their faith. In, like it's more foundation. They believe in Jesus because they believe in the Bible, right? And, and Maybe that's not a conscious thing, but that's when, if those slight variations really like cause your faith to be rocked, it's because you're you believe in Jesus because of the scriptures, not you believe in the scriptures because of Jesus, right? And this goes back again to that inward, right? Faith in God, right? That this whole thing works the way He wants it to, even if you know we start thinking about some things and your brain just starts to get scrambled because it's too big of a thing to contemplate. And Bob, you had something. I was just saying, you know, the world, I mean, they, you could destroy every Bible, every monument, but Jesus is the word. So, I mean, granted, we're blessed by having the Bible. But well, and, and he would come up with some other way, right? He'd either preserve his word, right? So, has anybody seen the movie, The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington? So, in The Book of Eli, uh, man, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it, but basically, it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic setting. And there was a big war. They don't say much about it, but the war was fought over ideology. And so one of the things that happened as a result of it is all the Bibles in the world were burned. Except for one. Right? And the main character hears a voice who reveals the location of this last remaining Bible. And there's some really cool twists and stuff, but it's basically a journey of this person who you wouldn't expect to be able to succeed in their journey who ends up succeeding and then preserving God's word. Right? So he could go about that route, right? I mean, he's the same God that basically busts into Saul's life and is like, I got plans for you, too bad, you're going, right? He can do all that stuff too. And even if all the, the Bibles got were gotten rid of, he would come up with some other way, right? Um, that's sort of my point there, is that our faith is in the God of the Bible, not the Bible, you know, attesting to God. Now, it's not mutually exclusive, but hopefully you kind of get what I'm saying there. Right? The prime, prime foundation is God, and then the Bible's faithful 
witness to him, not prime foundation is Bible and then God. Yeah. I have a question back to Saul. Yeah. Um, God is all knowing and he knew that Saul couldn't resist him. Wouldn't that Mr. Saul called Saul had his choice. Like you're talking about he might have decided not to do it. But he since God's all knowing, he knew he was gonna do it. But the call, the call isn't always irresistible. Like look at the rich young ruler. Right. He was able to walk away. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so this, that's, call, this, that's one this of the, call was irresistible, which is what I think. I think that's what the words mean was that this call was irresistible. I don't think all calls are. Right. So, and that's one of another one of those mysterious teachings of scripture is that, like, why would God allow us to, like, having had faith in him to turn away from him? Yeah. Because it doesn't, you know, us. doesn't make sense that that we would be able, not only like that we ought to be able to do that, but that we'd even be capable of it. Yeah, but you don't want to be married to a woman that you have to hogtie to stay married to you. <laughs> right, right. So that, that's, one of, that's one of the arguments, right, is that like God doesn't want an action figure relationship with us where right. he's just like, you know, pulling all the strings and moving your arms and legs to every, every little whim that he wants, right? He wants an actual relationship with us. Um, but the details of that and the relation of the will are sort of difficult for us to grasp like in a certain sense the desire for a free will as we often conceive of it is the was the original problem right our understanding of free will is i can make my own choices and usually when people are are like defiantly proclaiming that they're not talking about captain crunch or fruit Loops, right they're talking about what i want to do with my life what i want to who i want to love who i want to spend my time with all that stuff right and, and the defiant sinful human spirit is these are my decisions. I'm going to make them and live the way I want, right? Uh, that's not what Adam and Eve were doing in the Garden of Eden prior to the fall. That is what happened in the fall, right? That was the original temptation: is you can know good and evil and be like God. Except there's one problem: we're not God, right? We're not equipped to handle such decisions as human history clearly tests right? uh, in our own lives. So, you know, those are the like free will and predestination we'll get to predestination here a little bit today but those i mean we could we could do eight weeks on that easy um okay uh so i wanted to put this excerpt from luther's large catechism in here on the outline you and i could never know anything about christ believe in him or have him as our lord if the holy spirit did not offer it all to us and plant it in our hearts when the good news is preached the work has been done Christ has won the treasure for us by his suffering, dying, and rising again, and so on. But if this work stayed hidden and no one knew about it, it would all be for nothing and no good to anyone. God in his word publicized and proclaimed and has given us his Holy Spirit to bring this treasure, this rescue, near to us and make it ours. So to make us holy means the same as to bring us to the Lord Christ to receive the good which we could not get on our own. Right? So... This was something that we, there's a class at the seminary called Lutheran Mind, and essentially the theme of that class is if you think you're Lutheran, come and see, right? And then basically this is a class that's going to examine all the really difficult adherences to our confession that really cause a lot of people problems. And this is one of them, that when it comes to your conversion, free will is not involved. It's all the work of God, which means like one of our, one of the guys who really struggled with this for a while, literally he used the phrase, so I basically I just get like hijacked by the Holy Spirit. I mean, essentially, yes, right? Um, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, and come to him, right? But he has called me by the gospel, right? So that was sort of the point I was making in the sermon, too, that it isn't actually our job to do what we're doing here and explain this stuff to non-believers. I mean, imagine, imagine me trying to tell you any of this stuff if you're somebody who doesn't believe in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You're going to be like, I don't care about that. That's all, that's all based on this big assumption that I disagree with. Okay. So what is our job to do? It's all about Jesus. Right. Yeah, right. And what are we doing when we do that? We're bringing the Holy Spirit to bear through the means which God has given the church in order for us to do that. Okay. Now, we talked about this, I think, a couple of times before. Can the Holy Spirit come to people in other ways? Oh, sure, he's God, right? He can do whatever he wants. But he's given the church specific means by which to do that. 
by the word in the sacraments. And so that's what we do. So when you run into an unbeliever in your community, in your work life, in your home life, whatever, your job isn't to explain the finer points of doctrine to them, and even if sometimes that's what they want to talk about, right? You just respond with, hey, do you know that God loves you? And he loves you so much that he sent Jesus to pay for all the wrong things you did. And it's a free gift. It's yours. Right? And then you just let it speak for itself. Right? That's one of the promises in Isaiah that I cling to when I preach, right? That when God sends his word out, it's going to accomplish the thing for which he sends it. It's not me sending the word out. It's not accomplishing what I want it to do. It's accomplishing what he wants it to do. And so then my faith in him becomes very important because I don't know how that works. Right? When I'm preaching up there, how many people's hearts can I see and know? Not mine. Yours. Mine. Right? That's the only one I know. Right? And it's a good thing for all of us that we don't know each other's hearts, by the way. Right? Because <laughs> the only person with enough grace and mercy to handle that is God. Right? So I don't know how that works, but I trust in him. That even if I screw up, because I'm just a normal human person, or say something in a weird way that's hard to understand, that he's going to take care of it. Now, that's not an excuse for us to be like, well, it doesn't matter what we do. I'm just not even going to work on it, blah, 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 blah. But like, it, it, is a, it is meant to be a promise that relieves you of a burden that is not yours. Right? So, um, like, and I've noticed that sometimes I'll talk to people after a service, and they'll say, oh, Pastor, was, your sermon was great today. I love it when you said this. And I'm like, I don't think I said that. <laughs> right? um, and what I think that often is, isn't that the person was deaf or something. It's that like the Holy Spirit gave them what they needed to hear because he can see in their heart and know what they needed to hear. Right? Now, it's usually related to what I'm talking about. It's not something totally out of left field. But it's not exactly what I said. I mean, think about that. We can all read the same sentence and come up with like 17 different things as what that means. Right? So that process of ascertaining meaning, we believe, is guided by the Holy Spirit in the context of preaching in a church. And it has to be. Otherwise, what's going to protect us from like our sinful flesh just taking a meeting and running with it? And sometimes it happens, right? Because we reject what God is trying to show us, which then gets back to the free will stuff. So if you're interested in free will or predestination and that stuff, let me know, and I'll make sure it gets in the rotation starting in the fall. Okay. What time is it? Oh, goodness. All right. As per usual, we're not going to get anywhere near the end of our outline. Okay. Uh, let's do this last one here. What do the scriptures tell us about who does the work of faith? Um, we're going to be page 206 in your catechism there. Uh, and then those scripture references. So I'm going to look up 1 Corinthians 2.14. And then somebody else, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. I have a question. Go ahead and read it. That's why only someone who has God's spirit can understand spiritual blessings. Anyone who doesn't have God's spirit thinks these blessings are foolish. All right. So it, without the Holy Spirit, they're not going to understand the blessings of God, right? Okay. And then 12, verse 3. Somebody got that one? Or it's in here in the catechism. Oh, wait. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 is right in our book. You want me to read that one? Yeah, I might have mistyped that. It might be 12, 13. I think it is. It says 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Yeah, go ahead and read that. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews were Greeks, slaves were free, and they were made to, oh my gosh, and they were made to drink of one spirit. Okay. So what do these verses tell us about who does the work of faith? Lord. The Lord does. Very good. All right. Then Ephesians 2, um, 1 to 10. And then this will be the last thing we'll be. This uh, letter B will be the last thing we'll talk about today. Sorry, but with the mask also off, I think a lot of, I'm like Garrison Keeler over here. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Ephesians 2, what? Uh, Ephesians 2, we're looking at verses 1 through 10. Go ahead, Russ. 
When you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once washed, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable richness, riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by faith you have been saved, through, for by grace you have been saved by, through faith, this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. All right. Praise the Lord for that. Did we spend a year on it? Yeah, I love that one. That's great. Um, so what what way are we described as being prior to Jesus here? Dead. 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 What do dead people do? Nothing. And then what is described as what happens to us here in verse 5. So we were dead in our trespasses. What happens? But by grace you've been saved. Before that. Made alive with Christ. We've been made alive. Okay, so it, and then in English we, we would call that that's the passive voice, right? So something is being done to you. That's why we're not making ourselves alive. We're being made alive, right? Which means it's something that is not being done by us. It's happening to us, right? Uh, and here, so the language is very clear. Uh, who's doing the work of, of faith and, and this new life is God, right? Through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? And so um, the work of faith is not your work. Now, why is that important? So one of the images I like to use is, let's say that the the relationship between you and God is represented by a 100 link chain that ties both like your from your chest to his. Okay. And sin comes along and breaks that chain. Okay? Our relationship is no longer right with God. In order for it to be restored, Jesus comes and he restores it. Now we hold that he restores the whole thing on his own without any of our help, right? Because we're dead right? and we're being made alive. Now, if any part of that has to be made by me, whether it's 50 links or one link or like an eighth of one link, what's the problem? Faith or plus works. Do what? Faith it's works. faith plus works. And we're talking about justification here. And that then automatically casts doubt on the whole enterprise because I'm responsible for, th for some small part of my salvation. And if that's the case, I can never really know for sure. Although that last line of that at the ancient creed, Thank you. Feels, 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 those who have heard the word. Huh? So those are There's the, nobody? Those are the fruit bearers that believe and bear good fruit, maybe. Like, yeah. you know, I could put carrots in and asterisk that, but the main plain reading of those words is yucky. <laughs> well, so, but then, I mean, those are. That's my, that's my technical opinion. It's what? <laughs> but that's, a, that's basically the, the re rewording of the sheep and goats text, right? Because it says the same thing, yeah. right? So we understand. So when, so one of our methods of scripture is is uh, scriptural interpretation, is that we let the clearer text interpret the unclear text, right? So, for example, when James says faith that works is dead, we understand that in light of like the hundred other places where faith is clearly not a work, right? And so faith that works is dead is understood in that the works of faith are the bearing of the good fruit, right? And I don't think that imagery is, is accidental either, right? What bears good fruit? A living tree. A living tree. How does the tree become alive? It's made alive. It's made alive, right? 
So when we, when we see the phrase, those who have done good, is there anyone that's done good? Jesus has. And what do you have? The Jesus stuff. Right? That includes his perfect righteousness. Right? So that's what that means. So we, we do good by virtue of wearing that robe. Yep. And James is not it's a lot of asterisks and carrots you have to put in that. <laughs> well, I think it's also because the the language in general of that is not modern Western style. And it's very philosophical. I mean, basically because it's, like I mentioned in my sermon, it's a human wording trying to describe things that are really indescribable by our, our own words. I was just to say, we bring with advantage of that's our understanding of how the theology of the world is, right? Good people go to right. heaven, bad people go to hell. Who is good, who is bad, well, your deeds, whatever. And so it feels like sanction of that, then we know it's totally different because it's put onto the theological framework of the Trinity. But right. it still feels like that's what the world says. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Right, which once again points back to the importance of my hermeneutical lens being Jesus. Like Jesus is the one that's defining good and good works, not me or the world, right? Me and the world want to say, well, you help that little old lady with her groceries across the street, and you say nice things to people, and you go to mission trips, and all this other stuff. Those are the good works that get you saved, right? That's our natural inclination, right? Um, but Jesus bursts into history and says no to all of that, right? And he doesn't say no as in, like, that's totally wrong-headed to think that way, but it's no longer the way by which you are going to be justified. I will fulfill that path because you can't, and then you get my stuff. And you don't have to earn any, you don't have to earn it, I've given it to you, right? And so we are those who have, who do good works. Those who have done good works are those who believe in Jesus. And it's so, and even uh, the end of this passage right here, right? Verse 10, well, look at the way it describes good works. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? So we're his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, right? So the way that good works is described in the New Testament in light of Jesus is like, it's the good stuff you do. Because we know Jesus. Well, it's just like, it's not stuff you have to go on a quest to find or go out of your way to do. It's the stuff you do in Christ, right? Those are the fruits of faith. So I, I sort of used this as an example, I think it was last week, about the difference between like a family where the parents stayed home from a mission trip and spent devotional time with their kids and taught them about Jesus versus going on a mission trip and building houses or something. Who did the better thing? Right? Who did the good work? Okay, right? In one instance, there's a possibility for good work. Is it good work to, as motivated by your by the gospel, to go and help people in need? Of course it is, right? It's not a guaranteed good work because you could do that without ever demonstrating Jesus or saying anything about Jesus, show up, build something, and leave. But it's a guaranteed good work if you're following the fourth commandment. Right? So, and I'd say that not to say there's a mutual exclusivity there, there isn't, but to say that we have to be careful what we define as good. It has to be what God defines as good. And Jesus, I mean, what Jesus comes in and does is totally redefines all that stuff. Right, he even does that with the law. He says, well, if you think you've got the fifth man because you just haven't murdered anybody, let me tell you. Right? And so that's why that lens needs to stay Jesus. So does that answer your question? All right. Okay. Last thing I'll say, and then we'll be done. Is and we won't, you can look at those scripture references there under do we at least help? Um, question. What about repentance? And I felt the scriptures really were pushing me on this in the in the text for the sermon the last couple of weeks to remind myself and by virtue of the text everyone else that repentance is not something I do because I fall into the temptation of describing it that way as do many people right 
that repentance is part of what the Holy Spirit does. Remember that first passage we read from John 16. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to come and convict the world according to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right? So that conviction, that, that contrition, is the work of the Holy Spirit guiding you to confess. So that even that, the metanoia is not my work. Okay. Any last questions about that? All right. Well, thanks for sticking around. We'll close with a word of prayer. Um, if you didn't get to participate in all of these, uh, we're going to be posting them online probably over the summer here uh, on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch from when we started with the Ten Commandments and not the Commandments. So, all right. Let's close with them. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that despite our our being dead in our trespasses and sins. In your grace and mercy, you made us alive in Jesus. Help us to find comfort and assurance in these promises that you have done all this work for us and given us your stuff freely as a gift, your faith, your righteousness, and a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Be with us throughout this week and in the summer time. Help us to be faithful witnesses to you and give us utterance as you uh, as you bring people in our in our path who we need to point to you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.